The Golden State Warriors are finally looking like they could be a real problem again. They are 10-2 in their last 12 and are looking great since the return of Draymond Green. While I do believe Draymond's return was the catalyst for this turnaround, most of everyone has been stepping up recently. Jonathan Kaminga is blossoming into what we hoped he could be, and Steph Curry is continuing to do Steph Curry things when he'll be 36 in March. Today I'm going to be going over the Warriors 10-2 stretch and why I think they could be a real headache in the Western Conference. Before we get into this, if y'all could like the video, sub the channel, and hit that noti bell, I would really, really appreciate it. Smaller NBA YouTuber trying to grow, and without further ado, let's get right into the video. While we can point to many things for this Warriors turnaround, undoubtedly the centerpiece of this sudden change is Draymond Green. Even at basically 34 years old, happy early birthday Draymond, he still transforms a team on both ends. Obviously his defense is his specialty, but what Draymond Green does for this Golden State offense needs to be discussed more as well. His playmaking out of the short role and his decade-long connection with Steph is much more important to this team in their success now and in the past than most are aware of. Draymond Green is the easy test of who knows basketball to me. Casual fans will scream triple single, but people who truly evaluate the game know that he is just as big a part of this Golden State dynasty as anyone not named Steph Curry. Box score stats don't tell close to the whole story with Draymond, but you might be shocked at some of this. In this 12 game stretch, Draymond is averaging 10, 8, and 6 on 52.6% from the field and, wait for it, 48.3% from deep. Yes, Draymond Green is shooting over 48% from deep in the Warriors' past dozen games and is also shooting nearly 44% on the season in 31 games. We haven't seen this kind of three-point shooting from Draymond ever, but haven't even seen anything close to it since 2016. After shooting 38.8% from deep in that 16 season, Draymond wouldn't even touch 31% until his unreal performance this year. Now, I don't know if we can expect this to be sustained, but it really looks like Draymond put in some time in returning to his shooting days from earlier in his career, and it's paying off. But while Draymond's offensive impact is underrated, his defensive impact is generational. This season with Draymond Green, the Warriors have a defensive rating of 113.3, which would have them tied with the Pelicans for the 7th best defense in the league. Without Draymond, the Warriors have a defensive rating of 122.3, which would be good for the worst defense in the NBA by over a point, as the current worst is the Atlanta Hawks at 121.2. A great rim protector can completely overhaul the defense, and we are seeing this effect in Philly right now as well with the Sixers without Joel Embiid. I can't say I wasn't concerned about the Warriors, but I knew that they would be a completely different team once Draymond returned. Many other guys have stepped up in this run, but I feel like Draymond is the nucleus of this Warriors turnaround and is a large reason for things such as, for example, the turnaround Andrew Wiggins is experiencing. It might sound like I'm trying to give Draymond all the credit, but I just really want to emphasize his impact on this team from top to bottom because it has been far too understated forever. I knew Steph's shooting would never go away, but to see him still performing at this level all these years later is just amazing. Steph Curry was never the problem with this Warriors team, but the team around him finally being competent has unlocked him even more. Stephen Curry over this 10 and two Warriors run is averaging 35 and six on 50, 47, 90 in just 33 minutes a game. These numbers are beyond phenomenal, but I haven't even mentioned the craziest part. Steph's 46 and a half percent from deep. He's doing it while shooting over 13 threes a game. Yes, Stephen Curry over a 12 game stretch is shooting over 46% from deep on over 13 attempts a game. I'd have to think he's had a stretch like this before, but I highly doubt anyone else has. Steph Curry is remaining at the top of our game deep into his 30s, and while I understand he may not be in that top 3 range anymore, he definitely deserves more respect when talking about the best in our game today. The winning hasn't been there. But it is now, and I think we all need to appreciate the insanity of what Steph and his peers such as Brown and KD are doing right now. I get that we've seen Steph doing this for the past decade, but the fact that he is still here and great is remarkable. Steph and Draymond have always had an elite two-man game, and now that Draymond is back, Steph is back to being absolutely elite. In 22 games without Draymond Green this season, Steph is averaging 25-4-5 on 43-39-93 for a true shooting of 60%. Fine stats, not bad, but not outstanding given what we've seen from Steph. Steph Curry with Draymond Green this season, 35 and five on 48, 44, 92 for a true shooting of about 66%. The narrative has always been Draymond gets carried when his impact is everywhere if you're really paying attention. Obviously this doesn't mean Steph gets carried because social media speak isn't how basketball works, 
but Draymond's impact on both ends is immense. As I said, Steph was never the problem, but just how elite he has been recently is definitely helping. 46.5% on 13.3 attempts from deep is just unreal, and it was always funny to me how in this high pace, high spacing league that the team who ushered in this era was seemingly left behind. I mean this in terms of three point shooting. The Warriors have always been great defensively, but without a doubt were one of a few pillars shifting the game to the perimeter. We began seeing Jonathan Kaminga's true rise a bit before this win streak, and he has continued his stellar play into this stretch. The Warriors' two timelines project appeared to be more or less a failure until Kaminga was given the right opportunity. I'd honestly say a lot of how good the Warriors are in the final years of Steph is pretty dependent on how good Kaminga can be. They're capable of making another move, but having a star in house would make those things a lot easier, wouldn't it? While he has been fine during this stretch, using a wider scope we can truly see how good Kaminga has been, and the larger the sample size the better, right? Since December 1st, Kaminga is averaging 17, 6, and 3 on 55, 35, 74. After Kaminga more or less didn't play in the postseason last year despite at least more minutes as a rookie, I was questioning his place on this team. This is only his third season, so I thought he could get a chance elsewhere, but I figured his time as a key future piece in Golden State was likely over. And as of a few months ago, this looked like to be where we were headed. Kaminga, reasonably, as we see now, was upset about his playing time. I figured a trade was incoming, but instead Steve actually gave Kaminga what he asked for, and it's paying off for everyone. Literally. Kaminga's athleticism adds a dynamic that we haven't really seen with the Warriors since Andre Iguodala's prime. They've had bouncy role players at times, but never a core piece with this kind of athleticism. How good Kaminga is makes building the rest of the Steph Clay Dre era much easier. It's pretty simple. Either let Kaminga continue to blossom and know you'll at least have something when the big three goes, or package him for a legit superstar. I sort of figured the Warriors would gradually fade starting with last season, but the emergence of Jonathan Kaminga and the agelessness of Steph Curry and Draymond Green makes this anything but true. While Steph, Dre, and Kaminga have been the pillars of this Golden State turnaround, the remaining pieces and how they are used is just as important. Andrew Wiggins had an absolutely abysmal start to the season, but has finally found his groove here recently. Through 39 games, Andrew Wiggins was averaging 12, 4, and 2 on 43, 31, 70 for a true shooting of 51%. Pretty terrible, right? I was honestly confused what happened as this was by far the worst Wiggins has ever played throughout his entire career. I obviously began to question things, but I had to figure he would at least get better at some point, and well, he did more than that. Over this recent stretch, Andrew Wiggins is averaging 14, 5, and 2 on 53, 47, 86 for a true shooting of 65%. Looks better, right? Wiggins has been not only an outstanding connector and major piece in a title, but also a 38 to 39% three-point shooter since his arrival in Golden State. The stark drop-off to begin the season was definitely concerning, but I figured Wiggins had to at least get back to being decent, right? I'm going to be paying close attention to Wiggins for the rest of the year, but I think he will at least be a positive. Getting three pages into writing a Warriors video without really discussing Klay Thompson is pretty crazy, but here we are. This will be because for the most part, this Warriors stretch is in spite of Klay Thompson. In the games he played during this stretch, Klay averaged 14, four and two on 40, 31, 100. Klay has been far from great this year, and this came to a head recently with him being moved to the bench. This has come with mixed results, should I say. In his first game off the bench since his rookie year, Clay had 35 on 59, 54, 100 splits, but right after he had three points on one for nine against the Lakers. Luckily for the Warriors, one thing has been consistent in these games, and that is that they are all wins, two of which have been by double digits. Clay is very streaky and unpredictable at this juncture in his career, so I'm not exactly sure how to evaluate right now. You watch one game and think Clay never left, but you turn on the TV the following night and you'd think he should hang it up. If Clay can get his shot going going into the postseason, he can be a huge asset for the Warriors, but should this erratic performance continue, I don't know how much he can be relied on come April. As for the remainder of this Warriors roster, I really like the optionality present. The rookie Brandon Pajemski has been great and you have a wide variety of lineup choices. Elite small ball, Draymond at the five. Need to get big, you have Looney. Need a stretch big, you have Saric. Need more on-ball playmaking and creation? Chris Ball will be back soon. This combined with guys like Moses Moody, GP2, Trace Jackson Davis, and Lester Quinones filling out the bench makes me feel better about this team come playoff time. There is a wide variety of lineup options to match pretty much any matchup, a ton of shooting and creation, enough size, and some athletic wings. This Warriors team could throw a number of things at a playoff opponent, and this combined with all the experience all over this roster is making me think the Warriors could really make a run. You obviously have Steph, Clay, Dre, and Chris Paul, but even a number of the younger guys have been here for the championship run and the playoff run last year. 
This team is oozing experience and this will play in their favor in a very young Western Conference. I don't know what exactly to expect playoff time as there may only be two teams that I am 100% sure will win a playoff series in the West, but I really think the Warriors can give just about anyone a run for their money if they're clicking as they are at the moment. To wrap this up, as someone who became a Steph fan in 2012, watching him continue to dominate is amazing, and I hope we're all watching every chance we get because before we know it, never mind, we won't get sad right now. But anyways, this Warriors team is really clicking right now and they are shaping up to be yet another great team in an absolutely insane Western Conference. Again, because of how good the West is and this only being a 12 game stretch, I don't know what to expect, but I know at the very least they will give whoever they match up with in the first round hell. That's going to wrap this one up. If y'all enjoyed it, please like it up, sub to the channel, hit that naughty bell, comment down below what's your thoughts on this Warriors stretch. How far do you think they could go? Again, man, I, you know, the West, the thing, you know, there's so many great teams. I think there are a lot of teams that could beat them, but I think there are a lot of teams that they can beat. I'd probably pick them. I mean, I don't know if I'd pick them, but I'd give them a good chance to beat probably anyone not named Denver and maybe even like, like again, you know, we didn't see, you know, again, not that, you know, there's no perfect matchup for Jokic and I'd pick Denver to win. Like, you know, I, I don't really think you can blame anyone for that. But, you know, they didn't play them last year, and they played them a couple of years earlier. I think, you know, having Draymond, I, you know, again, I, you know, I'd rather, you know, for a Jokic matchup, I'd rather have Draymond than not have Draymond. Uh, I'll put it that way. Again, you know, they don't have the most size. They don't have a really big, big, you know, they have Looney, who's 6'9", who's also, you know, again, he would definitely be using that matchup. But, you know, again, but they have such, such versatility across the board, a lot of shooting, a lot of shot creation. Um, you know, you know, a lot of scoring. I, I really think this team checks all boxes and could be a real, real problem. There's definitely a world where they're a first round exit because this is, you know, again, the Western Conference is just so, so stupid. But, you know, hey, man, we're going to see. Once again, that's going to wrap this one up. If, you know, if you're still watching, comment tissue. I don't know. I'm looking at a tissue box. And that's going to wrap this one up. I'm out. Peace.